start the recording. Good afternoon to all and welcome to this virtual learning and sharing on partnerships and sustainable development for the coffee sector in Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. I see a few more people joining. Um, so let us perhaps give them half a, half a minute more uh, to join us. I hope that you've all uh, had your lunch uh, and maybe perhaps sipping coffee uh, right now. So I hope that you will enjoy, uh, well, learn a lot from this afternoon's uh, session. Okay, it's, it's a minute past uh, the hour. Uh, so good afternoon again, and thank you for joining us for this virtual learning and sharing uh, on partnerships and sustainable development for the coffee sector in Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. My name is Reggie Lee, the Programs Director for Grow Asia. And as we continue to wait for people, uh, let me start with the housekeeping. Uh, the first is please do rename yourselves, uh, add your organizations uh, to your name if possible. Second, please remember to mute yourself when you're not speaking and you can use the raise hand function if you want to speak to everyone or, or if you encounter any technical difficulties, you can try logging on, off, off and on or send us a private chat. Uh, anyone with, with the, the background like mine uh, will be able to help you. And during the course of the presentations, you may also use the chat functions to make comments or ask questions. Uh, in each of the the sections on Vietnam, Indonesia, and Philippine speakers, there will be a moderator who will then at the end of those presentations um, select a few questions for the speakers to answer. And we will have a dedicated time for this Q&A and group discussion after the updates and presentations. So I want to start by thanking all of you for making time to join us in today's meeting. Coffee in dollar terms is the most traded agricultural product in the world and coffee uh, throughout the world, including the Asia Pacific region, supports millions of small farmers and their families. With world coffee prices at their lowest levels for many years, um, this threatens the, the existence and the livelihoods of many smallholder farmers. And such prices represent a real threat to the industry. And so there's an opportunity to improve um, farm incomes through sustainable development, through sustainable production of high value, high quality coffee, and this learning and sharing session has been organized at this critical time to derive partnerships uh, as well as to, to derive partnerships and sustainable development to assist smallholders and the coffee industry in the region with timely practical interventions drawing from the many uh, successful coffee models run by the Grow Asia and the country partnership partners that you will hear from today. In fact, there are many ways and practices which will make a difference to the quality of life for small producers while ensuring that their farming systems and incomes are both improved and sustained. So it is very fortunate that in today's meeting, we have assembled many distinguished people, well experienced in the coffee sector who are willing and eager to exchange their knowledge and experience. We had uh, almost 180 people uh, registered for this session and uh, today I already see close to 90 with us in the room. Um, as, as we get to know each other, I think it, it's many people in the room. Let us ask a few uh, poll questions so that we can get to know each other. Uh, so Vijay, I invite you to launch the poll. Uh, you will see three questions, I think, just for us to know which country and region uh, you, are, you are joining us from. The second question is which sector you are in. And what are you, the final question is what are your expectations from the event? So let's, let's give everyone maybe 30 seconds to just uh, fill up the questions. Con ơi, đừng có đào con nhá. Con ơi. So everyone, if you're just joining us right now, we are just doing a get to know you poll. Um, so fill up, you know, let, let everyone in the room know which country you're from, what sector you represent, and your expectations from the event. I see about half of the room have now answered. Let's give it five more seconds.
Okay, VJ, I think about two thirds of the room uh, have, have answered already. 80% now, I see. So perhaps you can go ahead to, to share the results. Thank you. So I, I, I see the results in front of me and hope you see it also in front of you. Uh, so we have many people joining us from the Philippines. Kumusta, mabuhay, uh, and good afternoon. Vietnam uh, and Indonesia and other ASEAN countries. Thank you very much for joining us. And many of the people in the room are from the development partners and NGOs, as well as the, the public sector as well. And, and I mean, from the private sector side, it, we have a very good distribution across uh, the value chain. Uh, and for, for those of you, I'm glad to see that it's a chance for you to come to network uh, and build partnerships, not just within the countries, uh, but also uh, across uh, the countries and raise awareness and share, uh, you know, their challenges in, in, in the industry. So thank you for that. Um, so Vijay, you can go ahead to stop sharing the slide. Um, I'm, I will go to our next slide. It's just to show you our agenda over the next two and a half hours, where I'm excited that we have representatives from our coffee partners uh, in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam being willing to share their knowledge and experience, especially around the common challenges for their sector. So without further ado, oh, uh, without further ado, let me just uh, invite some of our uh, opening speakers. Uh, I invite uh, Mr. Dong Ngoc Si, Sustainable Manager at JDE, and co-lead of the Coffee Task Force of the Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture in Vietnam to say a few words. Uh, Mr. C, thank you. Please go ahead. Mm. I hope you hear me well. Thank you very much, the moderator. So uh, first, uh, we would like to thank you very much for the organizer to invite uh, uh, Vietnam Coffee Task Force to have a very short uh, speech. And uh, uh, we see that uh, this is a great opportunity you organize that is a very important event. Uh, not only uh, you guys would like to sharing the experience, the learning from the country, but you expanding for the regional level. So I think that's a great opportunity for the network and also for find opportunity to make a bigger impact in the regional level. As you may know that the Vietnam Coffee Task Force uh, established in 2010, where it's very big, very diversified of the member from the government, from the private sector, both from the local exporter and also international trader. Uh, we also have an NGO, and especially we also have a representative from the uh, coffee farmer as well. So the, at the moment, the, 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 the task force is uh, co-chaired by the Mass Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Nestle and JD, with support and assistance and secretary of a global coffee platform. And the task force operates in a pre-competitive way. Uh, for your information, very proud to say you guys that in the last few years, the task force will make a lot of big impact achievement to support for the whole coffee supply chain here in Vietnam. And uh, that's a great opportunity to, to improve the quality of the coffee oh, and, and also to, to support for the farmer to mitigation of uh, challenges in the coffee production as well. That's also of our future operation uh, orientation as well. So uh, in order to maintain and also well operation of this task force, we realize our experience in, 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 in the last few years that the ownership and the leadership uh, from the government is very important. Uh, specific here, mass is play very important role for the leading and for the ownership from this organization. However, we realize that the, the active participation, motivation, uh, driving force like an engine uh, from the private sector is very important who make a lot of contribution in cash and in kind. And another triangle, we realize that the, the, the NGO, uh, like the convening, organizing, coordinations, make a lot of, uh, how to say, it's linked from the different partner to, 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 to make sure that the, 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 the task force is going well. So maybe uh, today is, I don't want to make too much detail because in the next, uh, in the next agenda, you, you make presentation that uh, we are going to have a several uh, present the case study from, from Vietnam, uh, maybe for your further information. However, um, at, at I mentioned that uh, in Vietnam, there are a lot of uh, still challenges on the coffee productions, 
defragmentation, fine labor, uh, chemical applications. However, it's impossible for whoever one organization or one NGO or, or government alone to do. So I mean that to be like a collective action in this deep responsibility together from all the people, all the stakeholders to improve the situation. So that is how uh, the test force and how partnership from, from Vietnam uh, to do and, and to improve the, the coffee production. So uh, that's, as I mentioned, that's the case study. We'll show you more. Um, uh, again, uh, to find this, I, 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 I would like to thank you very, very much again. And we do hope that we are not only to, to say our experience, but we also would like to learn from you guys and especially our dear colleagues from uh, uh, Indonesia and the Philippines as well. So uh, we hope that we can get the connection. And um, I, I, I wish you have a, like, a very successful meeting and healthy and be well and take care. Thank you. Thank you and well said. Thank you, Mr. C. I will also now pass it to Pak Ino, Executive Director of Peace Agro, to give some welcome remarks from Indonesia. Um, thank you, um, Rigi. Um, my dear um, colleagues from Asia and um, partners, my dear friends from PISAF of Vietnam, um, PPSA of the Philippines, honorable speakers from multiple sectors, um, distinguished um, guests, member, partners, um, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore, magendeng hapon, uh, ciao bui ciao, uh, good afternoon, um, happy to um, e meet you all. Uh, hope we all are in good health. Um, welcome to today's um, regional um, coffee learning and sharing event uh, on the partnership of uh, and sustainable development for the coffee, coffee sector on the three uh, countries. Uh, thank you to all the speaker um, and participants um, uh, joining us here today. It is with um, great a pleasure to be here, uh, to be able to collaborate with our friends from the other country partnerships, um, PSAF and PPSA, with support uh, from Group Asia to host our first collaborative um, regional event. Coffee um, is, is one of the most traded um, commodities in the world. Um, and in Southeast Asia, it's one of the uh, top, uh, we, we're one of the top coffee producing regions, right? Um, it is highly consumed by um, so many people around the globe. And even for us, most of us, um, our life begins with coffee. I was looking uh, through the internet last night, um, just last night, and found out that um, there are hundreds of, of life inspirations quotes about um, coffee. For instance, um, I'm, not, I'm not a morning person, I'm a coffee person. Um, and then a bad day with um, coffee is way, way better than uh, a good day without coffee. Um, so it is, it is um, important uh, for most of us. Um, looking, looking at in Indonesia, about 90% of our uh, coffee plantations are sustained by uh, the, the smallholder. Um, we chose uh, both um, uh, challenges and, and also opportunities. Um, at Peace Agro, we believe that helping um, smallholder um, are, is the key to increasing the quality and the quantity of the coffee. Um, so I believe that I think I think later our representative from from, from Indonesia will will speak more about this uh, on the session later. Today's um, webinar is a great I think opportunity for uh, the country partnerships um, to share um, and learn uh, and the experience in each country uh, regarding the main issues, challenges, partnerships. Um, and um, identifying the stakeholders around the coffee commodity. Uh, I think, and also it, to identify uh, if there is any uh, potential linkage markets among the stakeholders in the respective countries, right? So I'm sure we will be having uh, productive discussions. Together we can accelerate um, exchange of experience and ideas to scale up uh, best practices 
uh, that have been, I think, going on in respective countries. Without um, further ado, let me pass back uh, the floor to uh, Bridgie. Thank you. Thank you, Ino. And of course, third last but not the least, Ami uh, from the Philippines. Please, Thank welcome. you. Thank you, Reggie. Good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon po to our participants, especially those from the Philippines. We are privileged, of course, to be part of this collaborative event. Given the pandemic, we in the Philippines Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture, PPSA, also see the great value in creating and managing stronger ties with partners nationally and internationally. We hope that this session will give you that opportunity. As mentioned by Ino and the previous speakers, we are confident that this session will allow you to not only gain new insights, but also to encourage you to initiate partnership building and networking. In the Philippines, and I am sure in other parts of the world as well, it has been a challenge to adjust and adapt to the changing times. And in this challenge, the vulnerable ones, which include most of the coffee farmers, need support. That is why the PPSA's Coffee Working Group, through the leadership of our working group lead, Ms. Ruth Navales of Nestle Philippines, who will be speaking later, hopes to support coffee farmers through knowledge sharing, partnership development, and roadmap support. Our support to this session evidences our commitment to extend our hands further so that our coffee farmers would reap the benefits of their hard work, enjoy happy lives, and of course, we as coffee lovers continue to support them while we enjoy the aroma and taste of coffee. Today, we have speakers, special mention to Ms. Georgie of Coffee for Peace and Ms. Ruth, both leading award-winning coffee teams in the Philippines who are generous enough to share their projects, experiences, and of course, opportunities to work together beyond our country's borders. Their stories of peace and collaborations will inspire us to do more and find ways to address the challenges faced by our coffee farmers. Thank you so much again for being with us this afternoon, and we hope you find this session informative and fruitful. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you, Ami. Uh, so without uh, going further, uh, let me invite Zhang, uh, who will be moderating our Vietnam uh, section. Thank you, Reggie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Zhang from the Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture in Vietnam. And I'm glad to be the facilitator for the sessions on Vietnam. So as many of you has already know, the Vietnamese coffee industry has been developing successfully over the past decade and become the largest producer over the world. Robusta coffee productions account for the 90% of Vietnam total output and uh, almost 15% uh, of the overall global coffee productions. Coffee, the second largest agriculture export um, products in, in terms of value after rise in Vietnam with uh, a, a last year annual, annual turns over around 3 billion. Um, that is about 10% of Vietnam agricultural export. Um, like um, NC has already mentioned, after decades of pool booming, the sector is also facing with numerous issues that need to be considered and addressed in a joint sector's approach as they are too big to be addressed by a stakeholder indiv individually. And Vietnam partners are now working hard together to, to promote uh, greater coffee sustainability, to adapt the production models, and further develop the best practices at all segments in the value chains, nationally and regionally, to increase resilience against the climate change and provide economic uncertainty to the smallholder farmers. Now for the sessions uh, in Vietnam today, we will be listening to three presentations and we will have around, I think, 15 minutes for a Q&A during the presentations. If you have any questions, please just feel free to type in the chat box so that we can direct them later during the Q&A sessions. Now, first of all, um, I would like to uh, welcome Mr. Nguyen Van Kiet, the country rep representative of uh, the Rainforest Alliance in Vietnam to share experience in tackling child labor issue in coffee supply chain. Um, personally, we have been known with Fiat for so, so long time, and he's a top expert when it comes to certifications. Um, in addition to coffee, also support farmers and other value chain actors in other um, sectors like cocoa, pepper, and teas. So I think um, enough for the introductions, Mr. Thiet, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Zhang Vu, for, uh, for the very nice interview and bring me on the top of the coffee sector in Vietnam. Uh, 
I will uh, share my screens. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Nguyen. Uh, I am the Refrain Lion Country Manager in Vietnam. Uh, as I know, in the past up to now, in, we uh, joined a lot of the different uh, events, webinar, workshop, meeting anywhere around the world. But in the Vietnam, we very little or nothing uh, people who can talk on the child level issue in the coffee sector. Is it uh, no child level in the coffee? No, I can say no, because as I see on the field, with compared with other jobs in agriculture, it is uh, less the child level than other jobs. However, in recent years, due to the lack of the labor decision, uh, labor, especially in the harvest of, uh, harvesting of the coffee, uh, is having in some place, due to child labor. But as we know, according to international convention, uh, I, I law and the labor law in most of the country around the world have mentioned the Thai labor. It's not allowed to use the Thai labor in a working day in the field uh, and have a very clear description what is the Thai labor, what are the dangers that work the effect to the health and the child or the children. It is not allowed if they are allowed to do that. However, there is very, very little farmer know about that and no, no, nobody imagine and taking care this case in the field. So the Thai label in the coffee industry is happening. Therefore, in the, we are implementing a program for the awareness raising on the Thai label low, find the best solution to apply the and replicate it locally. This is the mind 10 minutes for my presentation today. Uh, we organize the program, but let me say it is project. Uh, we involved in the two important key players in the big uh, coffee roster. The big guy from the uh, webinar is Mr. Silo, also uh, one of the member partners in this uh, program. And in this project, we uh, work together with uh, two local companies and we organize the program and we try to bring forth all of the people uh, with the two important messages for the project. The first important message is to get, let give the children for the happy day. To compare the, the, the picture in the right side and left hand side, we don't, have, don't like to have the, the picture in the left hand side, we try to bring to the right hand side. And the second message from the, the project, we, we would like to share to send a message important to the people in the coffee sector, let's shorten the distance between the poor and the medium coffee farmer. Not very poor, we try to reduce and cancel and nothing poor people in the coffee sector. They say we work together under supported by the Dutch government, Lavaja, GDE, and two important, uh, two partners in the, 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 the local company and we take the action together. Uh, we organized a survey in the last time uh, with the six different communes in the two different uh, provinces in the Vietnam, Yalai and Dark Lab. What we see the four roads where the, the child labor coming. The first is the, 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 the people is very poor. The farmer in the Vietnam, very large, a very, very small size of the land use for the very low productivity, low income and uh, not enough cover on the, the, the living condition for the family. The limited uh, uh, awareness raising, no, they have a lot of the training on that, on, on the agricultural practices. Uh, we have a lot of the training on the sustainable agriculture, but nobody mentioned about the child labor. So all the people not fully understand what in the law in the Vietnam mentioned about the child labor. Nobody know, nobody take care, they don't care about this. And we have another job, the reason is the lack of a of the job for the, the student when they stop working at the school with uh, younger than 18 years old. And uh, of course, in the harvest season in the coffee areas, we have a limited uh, the, the, the working day, the, the labor cost. So some people, they use the children in the family to go to field to have the barn for the coffee harvest. And another important thing, we're finding some, some interesting data. For example, here the graphic is Household income and how household spend. Uh, six play here. We have a six different commune in the two different uh, the provinces. The black and the blue is the minority. 
and the green and the yellow is the king people. And these two different communities here, hundred percent of the minority people, and four all the here mix between the king and the uh, the minority. If you see in red, is uh, even the highest income in the family in the year about ten thousand maximum. But if we compare with the spending, uh, the money in the years, you know, almost at the balance and less. And did you say that uh, well, you, we, we can say uh, see that this is a very, very low living condition in this area. We uh, already have a, a survey and data collection. Here is a try drop down or not go to school. You see the some place drop down or a part of the go to school. For example, the, the highest is the 70% of the children. Some they go to school, some they not go to school, and of course they go to the field. And some earlier it is very low like this. That means they can partly and uh, and drop out school. They still have a lot in the in in, in the areas. This is the, the issue and challenge. This is a Thai labor. With that our research study, we have the some place with the forty five percent use of Thai labor. And some of them lower is a 10%, five or six percent of, of child labor. That we have the big issue in the in, in the coffee sector now, but we like we forget nobody mentioned it. Uh, it this is the reason why we work together in a certification program with on a partner donor like a big guy GTE now. We try to focus this project uh, to raise awareness, to find leisure learn, and then to expand in more in, in home countries. That means we will plant uh, for the next three years. Now we have a three year before with the time label issue with the general leaf, but now after three years, we're taking care of the, uh, the tree, and after three years, we have uh, the fruit without time label. And we invest four important uh, activities, four important activities. The first, uh, to have the people, the farmer have the living conditional income. We improve the knowledge and experience, uh, experience for them to reduce into cost to high productive and then high quality to have a more income. The second is to bring to the children have the knowledge and the thinking the high, uh, upper high priority for them now to go to school. Without those who go to school, without capacity, knowledge, in the future you can do anything, you cannot. The third, for the, the, the training, some people raising awareness of a big problem, a very big program like this. We cannot work alone, so we coordinate them with the all local authority uh, until the NGO in Vietnam, until the government level in high level together, we work together. And of course, uh, we have the uh, two companies join us in this uh, program, so we train them, support to them, provide to them some tools for the monitoring and evaluation, let them learn from this activity. We have a two important key activities. The key important activity is the one is the raising awareness for the farmer. And like what I said, we train the farmer with the 1,500 coffee farmer in the parties. Uh, we train them a lot, but we only select the seven important topics who would influence about the income for them, like the reduce the input cut and increasing the productivity and then the quality of production. And we use the, the methodology of growth abroad and learning by doing. And we try to blend any uh, agricultural part. This is training session. We combine with starting 45 minutes, at least talking about the time level. Day per day, month per month, year by year. So the farmer have the thinking in the time level is very important for their children in the family. And to do this, we also organize the training of the trainer for the 40 people can support us in the daily in the field because we cannot close a very close with the farmer. The people can help us to do that. They go from the technical staff from the company, from the teacher from the school, and the local authority organization in, in, in the world. For the children, we also support around 1,500 children belong to the 1,500 family of coffee. Fam, uh, coffee families, and we organize them by club. We organize by club and we train them, organize a picnic in the weekend, and we raising awareness for them. Think about the coffee. Give coffee very important for their, uh, for his family, her family, and maybe it's very good position for their good successful 
and very good for them. In the future, if the pattern retire and no more work in the coffee, and they will replace the worker, the manager in the, in the coffee field. Otherwise, in the future, nobody working in the coffee. It is a big issue for the coffee sector in Vietnam. If now we don't do that in the uh, 20, 30 years later, maybe some of the children, the young people, not like to go to school. This is very important. To do that, we work together with the manage, management team, with, with the headquarter, uh, with the partners in Florida here, and we are there here by internal uh, project management team here. We have here the CGTE, very big guy from Buffy, together with uh, uh, Rainforest Alliance Vietnam team to carry out and manage this program in the field with the two uh, local company under support, working with the local partner implementation. We find out that the independent consultant to do that. Outside the uh, external partners, we work together with, uh, we can communicate with the ILO, with the Dutch MSC, with the NGO or the Ministry of Agriculture in Vietnam to work together on this issue. And then we learn from them and we span all roll out in the whole coffee sector in Vietnam. The project we will start at the first uh, phase in the survey and assessment in the quarter one and quarter two of 2021. And we started Project B in the carrying out the implementing activity of the field from July 2021 until the December 2024. Uh, this is the plan. And uh, using uh, this uh, implementation, we try to focus on the very simple wood agricultural practices. For example, in the stream, this is the wood on the poster. This is the training menu. This is, for example, the farmer feed school learning by doing in the, in the on the demo farm. We can also organize the club for the children, raising awareness for them, train them, uh, thinking about the coffee, have some practice have the coffee, very, very simple work for them, some hours, a uh, picnic per day, something like that in the weekend. And we organize it to, to help the farmers some very simple business, for example, maybe some game or some flower business, something like that at home. And we also organize what we call the mobile library. It is a tool for supporting information by bookkeeping, poster, and also the television to use this in the training for the uh, uh, training for the farmer and also for the club activity of, of, uh, in, in the field with the children. The key outcome is very simple uh, in, in this room. Uh, the first here, the second here, and we hope that after three years, we go to the zero time level issue. issue. It, is, it looks very difficult, but our objective is uh, three companies will join Rainforest Alliance. And Rainforest Alliance have the, the, the requirement in the social sector, strongly and tricky uh, audit on the time level. If they pass the time audit, that means they are zero time level. And we believe we can do that, do that. Uh, we can successful in this. And after that, we have the update information to all the coffee sector in Vietnam and you all here, you are here together and we learn and try to forget for the another place in the future. That's it, this is my, uh, from my side. Thank you very much for the listening to listening me. And if you don't have, a, if you have any question, further question, please contact me and Shido. Thank you. Thank you, and Kate, for your very interesting uh, sharing. Um, it's thrilling to learn that you are not addressing just a shallow issue, but you are trying to build countries of future farmers who can lead the, the sustainable initiative of the coffee sectors in Vietnam. And it's interesting that you are also kind of integrating um, the digital technologies early in their education and training. Um, well, now so let's just move to the next um, presenters. Um, I would like to introduce Mr. Ngoc from uh, Nestle Vietnam. Um, so in Vietnam, Nestle has been working with farmers to support them in implementing regenerative um, practices um, via the Nest Cafe Plan Initiative launched like 10 years ago and the PPP approach, also known as the Coffee Task Force. So far, um, we have been able to reach over um, 16 million plant fed of um, high yielding disease resistant coffee varieties. 
um, which has been distributed to the grower in five central highlands of Vietnam. This has helped to renew over 46,000 hectares of age and low productive coffee areas, and also provide strong support to the government coffee rejuvenation programs. The initiative has helped to protect the, um, the natural environment through re reducing the carbon emission, through uh, practices like reducing the water use and um, appropriate chemical fertilizer and pesticide use. So Mr. Ngoc, he, he has been helping with uh, farmer in addition to coffee. He also supported farmer with pepper, cocoa, cashews, um, projects in Dak Lak and Vietnam. So now allow me to step back to for, for, for Mr. Ngoc from Nestle to, um, to share us about his experience. Thank you, Mr. Ngoc. Up, you are on mute. Sorry. It's me. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Yeah. Good afternoon, my dear friend. Today, on behalf of Nestle Vietnam, I would like to share the showcase for Nescafe Plan in Vietnam regarding the intergrouping model to improve the smallholder income in Vietnam. <clears throat> you know that the, every year, actually, Nestle Vietnam had been partnership with Red Red Lion to carry out the um, monitoring and evaluation assessment uh, to identify the current activity and also to see how to go further. And you can see that uh, actually we have very good trend. Uh, every year we have seen that around 6% six, six of the current situation of um, coffee has been shipped to interprobin model. But you can see that uh, actually from um, the current situation, uh, we have seen that um, many interprobin models have been in place around 80%, but in with only 37% is in the rubber model. That, that reason why we have to go to further. And you can see that the current situation right now, we have very good trend. Uh, the farmer has been shipping from uh, crop in Britain from monoculture to the crop biodiversity. That means uh, from traditional monocropping practice, you can say that uh, the farmer would like to keep it in order to increase efficiency of planting, increase the, the yield and also the habitat. But you see problem is they can increase the risk of disease or bad. Uh, and in this case, uh, when they shift to the intergrouping practice, they can optimize the land yield and also improve the income. And this initiative uh, actually has been um, introduced by um, Metcalfe Plan and Agriculture Services in 2012. And you can see right now, uh, you can see very the best uh, picture on there and all not of the area in Metcalfe Plan that have been shipped to the proper intergrowing model. And uh, the benefits, how the benefit to this one? Mostly, you can say that uh, we be improve the diversity of eco ecology system, reduce the water yield, reduce the chemical fertilizer, and also to control the waste suspension. And you can say that uh, uh, will be keep the farmer for stabilized yield and also improve the green coffee quality. And last but not least, we be increase and diversify the income for the farmer. And uh, you can see here, I, I just highlight very strong that, that uh, in our program, we have more than 21,000 farmers have been involved to this process. And uh, we also learned from the other project like uh, AgriGlosis, GSET, and GD and IDS. They also found that uh, with the intergrowing model, will be low emission 
as especially you can see on, on, on the, the highlight over there, uh, very significant important for them. And the carbon footprint will be, you see here, uh, the farmer we iron it, they go for integrated model. And uh, the creativity has been in, uh, in play. We have been introduced and disseminate proper intercropping model to all net cafe plant farmer and also to our net cafe country like Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, and, uh, and China. And uh, how to do so? Actually, we also focus on firstly on the farmer organization or capacity improvement through the trend of trainer. And you can see that we are continuously using the current 274 lead farmer. They will train on the GAP and Net Cafe Better Farming Practice annually. And uh, we also conduct the, the other activity in order to improve and also to appreciate the farmer like Farmer Appreciation Day or Coffee Day. Uh, last but not least, we also focus on the current farmer. Among of more than 21,000 farmers, we focus on more than 16,000 foresee farmers. We be trained on the key topic on GAP and Net Cafe Better Farming Practice and using the farmer physics school. And also we are using the uh, study tool like that on, on, on the field. This is the way of farmer to farmer sharing and learning. Uh, and in order to support the farmer, Netlay also support the uh, high hygienic coffee planet production and distribution to our farmer. And you can see that until now for the TOT, uh, we already conducted around 22 uh, TOT training and for farmer fish food training, more than 300,000 farmer had been extended. And for study two, around 32. And uh, for the planet distribution, actually we focus on the support for rejuvenation or renovation for aging coffee plantation, but not for new planting on the new area because we, are, we would like to ensure the deforestation. And uh, in order to support the farmer and also appreciate them, we every year together with uh, Netlay and also the DBB partner, we, we, we organize the Vietnam Coffee Day and also Farmer Appreciation Day. And this one, you can see that uh, until now, among 21,000 farmers, we, we already put them on the, you can see on here, um, the, the, the phase of the best practice farmer already on, on the, uh, the, board of, uh, the label of the, the coffee, three in one. And uh, for, for the uh, interplay model, how to go for, you can see that uh, uh, why we, we, we say the rubber, because the rubber before, if you go to the field, you can see the farmer, they do whatever they want. That is also the, the problem. Uh, why a uh, rain forever lion uh, assessment have been found that among 80 percent had been uh, applied in the cropping model only 37 percent in, in drop away and drop away here we promote the farmer with two row of coffee and one row of black pepper and in this case you see they they can very easily go on and uh, this is uh, the finding you can see that uh, when we apply the coffee to uh, intercropping with black pepper and the durian, uh, we, we, we use in at the fan around of the, the, the coffee plantation. And for acacia, we are using a bow tree for black pepper. And you can see that uh, for the first three year, you can see that the black pepper got the yield around one by two ton, durian two ton, and coffee is four ton. And uh, the income, you can see. Uh, from black pepper only 33 percent and mainly from coffee 53 percent and the farmer can get profit around more than 12,000 us and this one actually we we are calculation based on the current price and this will we, we'll be it depend on the price and you can see the income will be low and high and that is uh, the first scenario and the second one after five years you can see the black pepper go up to three tons, just see the, the normal, and the durian are less than around one ton, and the coffee is 
return and you can see the farmer can see the income from crop uh, into growing tree, even double of the coffee. And you can see that they can get up to uh, 16, more than 16,000 US a year. And uh, that's why you can say that uh, the current uh, interprobin model has been introduced and allowed will be support for the farmer to raise the income up to, before only thought about 30%, but now one red to 200 percent It depends on the current crop, right? And we continue to expand the model for, for all, even not in, in the Nakafe plan region. That's it all. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ingot, for your very insightful and detailed sharing. I understand that Nestle is taking very bold measures to kind of like reduce its emissions um, throughout the co whole coffee value chain by 2030 and fulfill its uh, net zero goal by 2025 to promote a sustainable development of coffee and heavy culture sectors in, in general uh, for a climate change response. Um, so just for many of you here to know that in addition to being the co-leader of the coffee task force in Vietnam, has, uh, Nestle has also stepped up its role as a private co-chair of the Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture in Vietnam and will take um, kind of like an active role in, in encouraging the business community to participate and contribute to the sustainable development of agriculture in Vietnam. Thank you, Wing Ngoc, um, Nestle, for your commitment and uh, to the sustainable development of Vietnam agriculture and particularly the coffee sectors. We look forward to seeing more impactful partnership and endeavors. And next, I would like to introduce Mr. Do Teng Chung from uh, Collective Action Initiatives uh, of the Global Coffee Platform in Vietnam. Hank Chung has been devoted over the 30 years of his career as a lecturer, researcher, and trainer of different development projects, particularly in the central highlands of Vietnam and the coffee sectors. For those who is new to the sectors, the global coffee platform is the involvement of the 4C Association, the Common Code for Coffee Communities, as of April um, 2016. Uh, and it has uh, various uh, partners from different stakeholders. Um, and in addition to so the membership, um, uh, accreditations and certifications, um, GCP has also been contributing significant to the PPP framework here in Vietnam, um, particularly the Vietnam Coffee Coordination Board and also a key player for the continuous um, development of the National Sustainability Curriculum, the NSC. So now, until we are eager to learn your experience in, in leveraging public-private partnership for effective uh, input management in sustainable uh, coffee development in Vietnam. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much, Zhang, uh, for your introductions. Yeah. First of all, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the organizing board and all of you for giving me this opportunity to be together with you at this very important event. My presentation uh, consists of uh, three parts. Next example, please. Yes. Um, the first part is an introduction of Global Coffee Platform and its Collective Action Initiative. The second part will highlight the Collective Action Initiative in Vietnam. And the third part I find very important is my sharing of experience and lesson learned from outside with you. As you know, now the global next mark, as you know, Global Coffee Platform is a multi-stakeholder membership association of coffee producer, trader, roaster, retailer, sustainability standard, and civil society, government and donor, united 
under a common vision to work together towards a thriving, sustainable coffee sector for coming generations. Currently, we are working uh, with uh, more than 130 member and 11 country platform uh, globally. Next, please. We are running uh, 40 uh, uh, different creative action uh, initiatives worldwide. The first one known as Uganda, Youth for Coffee Development of Farmer um, Forestry, um, um, Farmer um, Prosperity. And then the, the second one is in, uh, in Brazil, we are running the two uh, different creative action uh, yeah, initiative, the first one is focusing on uh, responsible new of uh, agrochemical, and the second one called improve social well-being in Brazil coffee farming. In Vietnam at the moment, we are implementing the collective action in this initiative on the responsible use of agro input for coffee in Vietnam. Next, please. Criteria for set up a creative action um, uh, in initiative. A creative action initiative is designed and developed based on a so-called pre-competitive approach to address an identified issue. So of course it aligns with the national coffee platform and aligns with the local initiative. And all the design outcome and be back generated from the initiative will be widely shared with uh, different stakeholders in the sector. And of course, GCP member and non-member are more than welcome to join our initiative. Next, please. In Vietnam, uh, our initiative uh, cover the entire Central Highland region, including the five main coffee producing provinces of Vietnam. We are working at not only at regional level, but in terms of awareness raising and advocacy, policy advocacy, we are, we are working at national level. The target of the initiative is reaching 200,000 coffee farmer. So the initiative is for or five years lasting from June 2020 to December 2024. In the phase of number, number one, now we are focusing so, on uh, glyphosate related issue. Beer. Probably you know that now uh, glyphosate become a very hot issue. Well, yeah, not only in Vietnam for agriculture, but uh, in general, but now. But, uh, on the coffee sector in particular. And the second phase, in the second phase, the initiative will extend its activity of, to other chemical, uh, including the instruction of, of alternative uh, for pesticide, herbicide, and uh, the instruction of the best with management practices. And uh, the initiative for total investment value, you know, at more than 1.2 million euro, funded by the co-financing co co partner, as you can see in uh, on the screen, including Lavazza Foundation, IDH, GDP, Pit, GDE Pit, Nestle, Southern Coffee, Newman Coffee Group, Chibo, and especially uh, the Vietnam Coffee Coordination Board. Next, please. So you know, on the screen, you could, you could see uh, our main activity and some first achievement based on the finding and uh, the design collected from our field research study. We developed a you know, policy brief for submission to the central government represented by Ministry of Agriculture and Rural uh, Development you know, so that they can you know, address the glyphosate related issue. And you could see that uh, one, some, uh, some communication and, and training product here, uh, such as uh, an integrated with management manual, 
the poster. And so far, we have been conducting uh, also a lot of uh, physical and virtual training courses for, for our, our partner in both public and private sector. Now I'm uh, moving to sharing our uh, experience and lesson learned uh, with you. We believe that set, setting up a well structured initiative governance and management mechanism is one of the key factors to ensure the, the initiative success. Developing a clear communication strategy and procedure can ensure the smooth communication internally and externally. In addition, strengthening relationship and alignment with other project program with similar objective and work scope. Um, will, by doing so, we will see for more energy, uh, synergy, we can save resources uh, and we can avoid double investment. We believe that uh, involving relevant partner, next please, Simon. Involve relevant partner from the beginning. I mean, from uh, the, in the initiative design process and during its implementation time, will increase their owner ownership sense. By doing so, we can leverage resources and share the cost and risk among one another. And into enhancing private sector and extension system via MOU in dissemination of knowledge and communications will help us efficiently reach out to a large number of targeted farmer and combining trial experiment and a few load for on the ground fact-based evidence. By doing so, we can share reason and good practices for scaling up We believe, we believe that engaging and cons uh, consulting top expert and leader of state management bodies, research institutions, and private sector in development of the initiative policy lobby, training, and communication will make, can make initiative product fully consented, recognized, disseminated, and used in the industry. Um, and with applying flexible implementation method to adapt to unexpected challenging situations, such as like you could see that now uh, in the context of the recent serious outbreak of COVID in Vietnam, uh, we make, can make initiative implemented on schedule with the desired quality. Last but not least, I would like to warmly welcome you all to join our collective action initiative RISO because by doing so, you, could, you can achieve greater impact. By doing so, you can increase your visibility and we can share the cost and risk among one another. By doing so, we can strengthen our knowledge, enhance, our reputations, and of course, we can save a lot of time for everybody. Thank you very much for your attention, and I think, I hope I can, everything is in time. Yes, thank you. If you have any question, please feel free to, to contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Enchung. Thank you for your very uh, interesting sharing about the global coffee, coffee platform and how you were able to yeah, integrate quite a lot of like public partners and, and private partners together to um, develop a joint initiative uh, to foster uh, better collaboration in the sectors. Um, again, thank you all the speaker for your very interesting sharing about the experience in Vietnam. So now let's move to the Q&A session. I've been seeing that there are quite some uh, discussion going on in the chat box. Um, so now, please, just any of you have like questions that you want to raise verbally to um, the speaker, you can write, raise your hand so that uh, we can unmute you uh, and you can ask the question directly to our speaker. 
uh, or otherwise uh, we could just start with the um, questions in the chat box first. Um, please also, if you have technical issue, you can just type your question in the chat box and, and hopefully um, the speaker, please, um, if you have time, please just like, uh, look into the uh, chat box and try to answer the questions uh, raised here. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm not I'm not seeing anyone raising hands. So let's just um, start with the question in the chat box. I've been seeing quite a lot of questions uh, about the intercropping model. So maybe I can introduce and knock again to step back and and answer a few questions. Uh, I've been uh, seeing that. Um, let me see. Um, uh, so we've been. Um, yeah, so I'll, uh, hold on. Let me just pull the question again. Um, Okay, um, so I have uh, Mr. Ngoc and uh, Miss Mr. Dave, I think he, he's from Lavaza, right? Um, yeah, so he asking if uh, the income is gross or net. Um, and Ngoc, could you just um, answer a little bit about the intercropping models, um, how to bring the most um, benefit for, uh, for coffee members, uh, uh, farmers about the density of um, pepper intercrop? Yes, thank you, Beth. Actually, you see, uh, where we do the calculation here, we mostly were using frost, not not uh, net profit, yes, because it depends on the coffee price and also the the interpropping model had been applied by the farmer. Because you see, for the short model, I already introduced like eighty percent of farmer had been applied, but only uh, thirty seven percent in the robber way. In, in, in this case, uh, actually, the, we, we got a different figure because the yen and also the other um, element not contribute to the um, good set for the farmer, like uh, stable income and also the, the coffee, because we would like to still keep the coffee in the main crop. Otherwise, you see, uh, the other crop will be the main crop, like you can see now. When you visit uh, the coffee plantation uh, surrounding Bumato City, and you can see the coffee intercrop in tree even more than the, the main tree in the coffee. And uh, I also have seen there um, on the Western regarding uh, about the uh, density of the intercropping model will be the, the one I present actually the more the proper one, because we have been identified, farmer has been applied so many different models. Even they can use a lot of our refractory tree uh, in the coffee plantation and the bow tree for plate pepper. But we have seen that only acacia is the proper one to keep the stable yield for bow tree, that is the plate pepper and also for coffee. Um, that, that, that's the first one. And we also have seen that uh, the people talking about why you know, or when we do the intergrowing model, the coffee yield will go down. Actually, you see uh, the coffee with the average yield in Vietnam around two by six to seven ton per hectare. But now the farmer would like to go for four, even 10 ton per hectare. But actually that is not sustainable way because we had found that uh, after we carry out the farmer preschool record keeping, and, and we found that even the farmer, they have more coffee, but they less income because they put a lot of investment on, on, on that one regarding um, fertilizer, regarding labor, and also you see the, the other, the cost will be heavily for the investment side. So that's why we identify I can at least 10 different model, and we found that uh, uh, with black paper, but not put in the middle, but should be in the row. 
uh, yeah, the, the one we introduced so far, actually the farmer had to uproot one, one more row of coffee and plant with the plate paper, but not inside. As you can see many more uh, yeah, on the field where you can see the farmer just put the plate paper in, in, in the middle of the tree, but that is the one we not really recommend the farmer to do so. Then uh, the, that, that uh, you see when we introduce this one, you can see on the picture I have saw on my presentation, that is the one the farmer before they they also not um, not allow not not want us to to go for, but now they say um, when we introduced this one since 2012 until now and they are luckily because you see they still keep both coffee and black pepper in 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 the wood set even uh, the coffee and black pepper price for last two years very low in 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 in, in seven years but they have no problem. But for the one, they put more uh, into a broken tree and they got a bit issue. Like you see, when the price of black paper go down and they uproot the black paper and now they put back and I think that is that, uh, impossible to do so. So, so that, that is the first part. And we are welcome for any explanation and also to make clear of, of the one we have been introduced to our farmer. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think the the questions on intercropping is like quite um quite of interest to many people here. So, but but we will may have to drop these and just move to the other topics. Um, I think uh, people here are also interested to know how to uh, for how small holder farmer want to be part of a of the mobile model of Nestle and JDs. Um, I know I'm, I'm not sure I'm seeing JD here uh, is still uh, here with us to address the questions. Um, Thank you very much, Dan. I think uh, missing out on a mm. very full view of the answering. So no additional from my side. Thank you. Yeah. Or, or hang up. I mean, I know that you have been engaging over 100,000 farmers in the future. So like if they want to join of the, uh, of the Nestle um, initiative, then uh, do you have any recommendations for them? See that uh, actually right now, uh, like the presentation from and Peer and, and Chung, you can see that actually the uproar we are using are nearly the same. We would like to build up the very strong farmer organization beforehand to do the, the other activity. So that's why we can see the key activities should be focused on the farmer improvement, both on the knowledge and also the skill. Because you see, uh, the, if we got the very big team of the project team, many people, but we don't have any strong team on the grassroots level like the farmer, especially for the lead farmer, then we, can, we cannot do anything. For the K of Netle Vietnam, uh, Net Cafe plan, we have been uh, carried out since, I think, mid sea also know very well who are beginning since 2011, when we go for sea. Then uh, in the first side, the farmer and so not so interesting about because they know that um, now there are so many sustainable coffee development program. But you see in the end, when the project comes, then everything gets back to the normal. So that's why the, the good case we, we have been so uh, actually now we're already together with farmer for more than 11 years. And they, they are still with us. And even we, we can expand the model. Uh, in right now, uh, you see, uh, we have partnership with many um, actors in the coffee value chain, even uh, ZDE and Netle also on board to support uh, many projects uh, in Vietnam regarding how to promote the farmer for the sustainable de uh, coffee development program. But in, in uh, you see, in, in, in the new approach, because we 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 not count on the number or the uh, but we count on the value. You see, because before the farmer they very proud. They say I am the number one in Vietnam because I can produce up to ten ton, twelve ton of coffee. But in the reality, the one yes three ton like the one I already mentioned three ton of coffee and three ton of uh, plate paper. They got more mm -hmm. income to the other. Because you see, for, for, for Netlay Vietnam and Netcafe plan, now we also go for digital. Then uh, we highly recommend, you see, other partner also using the digital line, uh, like the digital farmer fuel book. And this one, we will automatically 
consolidate and also give up the figure, the trend, how to go for the farmer. Because now a day we, we cannot carry out the training uh, have been planned before, but we have to carry out the training based on the training needs assessment, uh, based on the, the needs from the farmer side. Otherwise, you see very boring for them to extend because they know. Sometimes you see they extend because they, they get some benefits, like in some program they got the envelope, and some program they have the dinner, learn, or you see they get the gift and also. But when you raise the demand from the farmer side, uh, when they, they, they are need and they will go together with us, uh, even in the long term. And uh, that's why you see uh, what we have been doing so far together with our partner actually at in, in very good set. And uh, we also appreciate the support from uh, uh, current uh, activity from Grand Prairie Lion, uh, ZD, ZD IDS, Ro Asia, and also the, the other actor in the coffee value chain. Like, like ZD and, and La Bazaar or Netflix. Um, yeah, thank you, Ngoc. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for you. Yeah, thank you for your very detailed sharing. I mean, you even like step up to the other topic, um, like how to uh, kind of mobilize the resource beyond um, your the company itself. I think um, just still on the same topic. Uh, maybe Yang Chung from from GCP, you have uh, a lot of experience working with uh, with um, public stakeholder. I think um, then um, maybe you can co co contribute a little bit uh, on the similar topic and how we have been successfully in engaging um, with um, public stakeholders here. Well, thank you, Chang, for a very good question. Um... I think uh, probably the condition and situation of Vietnam are quite a, uh, different from the one in the Philippines or in the Indonesia. In Vietnam, uh, without the government, we cannot do uh, anything. I'm sorry, <laughs> like this. For example, uh, in, uh, when we tackle the solve the problem related uh, um, uh, to the use and trade of glyphosate, for example, we involve the local government central and local government, for example, we are working with the people committee so that they can take action uh, by propagating some of the, the regulations. Um, you could see that uh, the glyphosate was banned fully um, on the 30th of, of June uh, this year, for example. I, I believe that uh, in order to reach such a target, uh, we had a lot of contribution uh, from private sector, from NGO, uh, we call it lobbying or advocacy, whatever you, you can call it. And uh, so the role of government coordination role, um, role or instruction role, very important. And they are also in charge of uh, law enforcement as well, for example. Uh, what happens if uh, people, um, uh, they don't sell for glyphosate uh, at uh, daytime, but at nighttime, for example, Without the government, we cannot do anything. Of course, we uh, we don't use a so-called uh, top-down approach, but at least uh, I think we need to raise the sense of uh, responsibility and we need to mobilize uh, contribution uh, from from the government. Uh, I believe that they play very important roles. Yes. Yeah. Um. Th thank you, Wen Chung, for your very sharing. Like interesting that you can have uh month multi kind of like approach from top down and bottom up and even in the middle um yeah. gcp has been working wonderfully in kind of like navigating the whole landscape and coordinate all stakeholders together i think we have just like one last minute maybe the last minute for anthea to share the directions uh i think uh, we have a questions from uh from a, from a uh, 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 a participant from Indonesia asking about uh, that there are various certification body for coffee and if there are any direction for the futures, if uh, one will be um, doing the certification body to for coffee to cover all sustainability scope like organic um, de deforestation, carbon emission or child level. Uh, maybe and An can you just share some of your uh, perspective on this uh, comment? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, as you know now in the world right now, we have the 4C, we have the Ut, we have a Rainforest Alliance, we have a Fair Trade, we have Organic and Good Practice belong to this type. And now 
Kurs and Rain Threat Alliance merged since quarter one, uh, 20, 2028. Now Kurs and Rain Forest become the one together. And it depends the certification requirement is standards. The client can decide which one is helpful for them. For example, Rain Forest Alliance uh, standards now, we have to focus on the management and administration of the program. We have to focus on the agricultural practices for the improve uh, the income. We have a social, uh, we have environment. That may include all the criteria of the sustainable in general. Uh, for the coffee uh, sector, the people who decide which one they can apply with. It's very easy for the, the, the coffee sector because the who is the decision? Because this in the coffee supply chain is the final processor is the big player of the coffee roaster. For example, GDE. GDE knew very well about what kind of the certification program they can do with. Don't worry about this. But it is you yeah. say and in your question, you see the, the own CB, but in certification work, we don't use CB in any of the certification program. CB we call it the one independent organization who authorized by the certification itself and then help us to check and audit the people who comply with the requirement of standard or not. So mm. the conclusion is the people who can decide by themselves when they go to through the standard and they know which one is the best one for them. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Ingrid, for your sharing. I, I know that JD and, and CEU have been engaging quite a lot of certification uh, agenda. So maybe you want to, like, within just uh, less than a minute, can you share some of uh, your experience? Go back to me because I, I fully agree with Ingrid. It's a very well qualification the question. However, from my side, that we are for sure that certification verification is still very important for the future as well because it's very linked to the, the supply and demand as well, right? So uh, we do hope that uh, uh, for for the future, any uh, our customer is very important to request for this. Uh, for example, JD for us uh, for for us uh, responsibilities so is very important. So that's why the company we make our public announcement that in the year 2025 we are going to buy 100% of responsibility. So it means that's uh, from uh, not only from our commitment, but I, I think that's from our friend um, and also from many company uh, around the world also make a lot of con uh, contributions. So uh, I mean that's a uh, very it must uh, it depend on uh, supply and demand uh, as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ingsi, for your sharing about the uh, the orientation in the future and how partners can kind of like link the current uh, sustainability program into futures like our ticker uh, expectations. I think we're running out of time for Vietnam. Sorry that you have quite a lot of uh, questions, but if you have questions, just please type in the chat box so that our speaker can still answer your questions. Now I would like to introduce Ms. Uh, Ken uh, Suwari Maharani, um, our strategic engagement manager from Peace Agro for the session about Indonesia. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Zhang. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to all of the speakers uh, from Vietnam for the presentations. Really great insights on the uh, sustainability practice and partnership effort in um, Vietnam's coffee sector. Um, my name is Ken uh, from Partnership for Indonesia Sustainable Agriculture, Pisagro, uh, who will uh, uh, right now will be moderating this uh, next session um, on the uh, coffee sector in Indonesia. Um, Indonesia is one of the biggest uh, coffee producer and exporter in the world, and um, our islands in Sumatra, Java, Bali, to Sulawesi produce high quality specialty coffee. And um, here in Indonesia, we uh, produce both Robusta and Arabica variants, and 90% of our uh, plantations are uh, dominated by smallholders uh, with small hectares of land and also here in Indonesia the coffee demand um, especially for young people is actually growing and sales of specialty coffee from uh, uh, several regions in the country has been um, uh, significantly uh, rising over the years and not only locally but also the demand for the export of uh, for Indonesia uh, coffee products ha has also been contributing significantly to um, the Indonesia uh, GDP. 
but also there are still challenges here. Um, I'm sure later our speakers will talk more on this, um, um, the challenges uh, here in Indonesia, including um, the consistency of the production volume, the quality, the con competitiveness, and also um, the partnership effort here in Indonesia. And um, today we are going to hear more from our speakers uh, um, on Indonesia coffee uh, industry. First, we have uh, Mr. Rubens uh, Marki. He is the CEO of Louis Dreyfus Company Indonesia. Uh, hi Rubens, I see you already joining. Um, I hope you are good. Um, thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, Rubens uh, joined LDC in, in 2011 as uh, the Indonesia Head of Palm and Biofuels, where he uh, spearheaded the development of palm business in Indonesia. And he's also experienced in overseeing and driving LDC's uh, palm expansion across Europe. And in 2018, he was appointed as the CEO of Louis Traders Company in Indonesia. And LDC work in coffee sector in Indonesia um, uh, are uh, very uh, vast, uh, uh, including originating and processing Indonesian coffee, especially uh, coffee um, from Sumatra, um, serving customers ranging from uh, specialty roasters to multinational food companies. And um, today, Rubens is going to share uh, about the regeneration of the Indonesian coffee sector. So um, Rubens, please, the next 10 minutes are yours. Thank you very much, Ken. I um, appreciate a lot the opportunity to, to be here today, um, learning a lot from uh, the experience of our colleagues in Vietnam. Uh, very good to see that we are also on, on the right track in Indonesia with our initiatives. Um, as you mentioned, I, I learned a lot from my palm oil experience. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in Europe trying to develop um, that product um, from Indonesia, and I think I've I've managed to really learn a lot about the challenges and opportunities. And I think um, I've been able to use a lot of that experience in coffee as uh, we are going through a very similar journey. Um, I think Ken already mentioned I've been in Indonesia for the past ten years. Um, I can already call it home away from home. Um, I am originally from Brazil, though a very big uh, coffee producer and consumer as well. Um, I think I, I would like to start by giving a, a quick overview of um, Louis Dreyfus. So if we can pl please go to the next slide. I always like to start by just uh, talking a little bit about our values. Um, and the reason I, I do that is because um, I do believe that sustainability has to be uh, at the core of what we do. Um, um, we have a lot of business managers on this call. We have a lot of sustainability managers. And we know that if sustainability is not being um, taken uh, by, by the leadership as a priority, and if it's not a top-down approach, it can be quite frustrating for us sometimes to come up with sustainability initiatives and, and to continue to raise the bar in terms of sustainability standards. So I'm, I'm very proud to, to, to see, you know, to say that in our vision, in our purpose, you can clearly see that you know, LDC is committed to work uh, towards um, a more sustainable future. So, um, and when we talk about creating value, it has to be sustainable value. So obviously as a, as a merchant, we have a big task in our hands to produce more food. Um, and we can only do that if we do it sustainably. So again, that's the biggest challenge we have. How can we do more with less resources, right? The resources are getting more and more scarce, but we still have a, a, a very big challenge to sustain um, the production of food for a growing population. So um, I, I truly believe that sustainability at, at a core as a core value can be very powerful. If we can go just quickly to the next slide, um, just some numbers about um, LDC uh, worldwide company was founded in 1851. In fact, this year we celebrate our 170th birthday. Uh, we handle close to 80 million tons of commodities across six regions and over 100 countries. And uh, we do so through eight different business units. And the coffee platform is actually a very important one. It's one that um, has given the company a lot of good results and also has given us a very good incentive to invest further in that business. As a matter of fact, we just came out with an announcement for a new soluble plant in Vietnam. 
uh, that we, we are building and should be ready in the next two years. If we can go to the next slide, please. We talk a little bit more about our sustainability approach. So for us, what does it mean to be fundamentally sustainable? I mean, obviously we have to look after the environment um, and not only um, in the supply chain uh, that we participate, but also within our own operations. So, you know, just very much like um, Nestle and other, and other uh, companies in, in the sector, we are also coming up with our own um, emission reduction targets. Uh, we're talking about scope one and scope two emissions. Um, and we are always looking uh, for ways to reduce the environmental impact of our activities. Um, obviously, we have a lot of uh, assets, industrial assets, and we, and we need to maximize um, the opportunities to reduce the consumption of water, of energy, and also the production of residual waste. Uh, and this is an ongoing effort. Um, we have to look after our people, our biggest assets, um, through a very stringent um, uh, work, safety, health, and environment policy. And this is part of the KPI of all the senior, manager, uh, senior managers in the company. Com community engagement is very important. And I think that's what we, we are talking a little bit about today. So um, we believe in a very symbiotic relationship with all the communities that we reach out through our business. Um, and, and we do so independently, but also in collaboration with our uh, Louis Dreyfus Foundation. And, and this foundation is basically focused on sustainable farming projects. Uh, we, we work with um, existing farmers in, in all the origins that we're present. And we also work with the next generation of farmers. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, about vocational projects that we are engaged with. And obviously the partners are very important. Um, as, a, as a big and leading merchant, we have a big responsibility and also a big opportunity to engage with different stakeholders in the supply chain, both upstream and downstream. So I think that gives us a very unique opportunity. And with um, platforms like Pisagro, we've been able to come up with very interesting collaborations. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, zooming in, zooming in on, on, on Indonesia and uh, some of the things that we are uh, doing to contribute for the rejuvenation of the coffee sector. This is just a quick overview of what we are doing. Uh, we have a large presence in uh, Robusta in Indonesia with um, warehousing and processing facilities in Lampung. Um, and we also have some presence in Medan, which is uh, basically the Arabica hub in Indonesia. So that get, gives us an opportunity to work with both smallholder farmers in Arabica and uh, Robusta. We've been in the coffee business in Indonesia since 2007. Um, and we have um, about 80 people fully dedicated to that business in Indonesia. These are just uh, a sample of our partners, uh, JDE being uh, an important one, um, but we have uh, many different partners that we collaborate with uh, in, when it comes to sustainability. Um, next one, please. So again, I would like to focus a little bit more on, on, on this slide. And I think Ken was already uh, talking a little bit about how coffee uh, in Indonesia is really being produced by um, small scale farmers. We are talking about one hectare per farmer. Um, and um, it's important to look at the historical and the social and economical background here. Obviously, um, Indonesia has been uh, growing co uh, coffee for quite some time. The coffee has been introduced since the late 1600s in the country. But if you look at the, at the evolution, actually we have not made that much progress as far as modernizing the, the, the coffee farming sector. So um, that means that ha there's a lot of room for improvement just by doing what has already been discussed here in, in Vietnam, just by doing uh, capacity building, working with farmers to increase their awareness and also knowledge on just good agricultural practices. Um, there's also obviously um, a, a need for, um, a bit of investment in, in um, financing, um, not only replanting, but the existing um, businesses um, and addressing potential inequalities there, um, you know, gender inequalities that sometimes we see. So 
again, we've been um, spending quite a bit of time just um, addressing that, that part of, of the equation. But there's another interesting um, development, which I think is, a, is something a little bit more recent, which is um, what's going to happen to the next generation of farmers, right? As we see a lot of startups, we see a lot of new, um, new businesses that are way more attractive than traditional farming. So we do see um, a lot of the young people um, losing interest in um, coffee farming. Um, and, and, you know, coffee is just not as profitable, but also not as attractive enough um, as, a, as a business. So that's something that um, we, we are also trying to address with uh, some of our vocational projects that we are doing now in, in Indonesia. Obviously, the environmental um, impact is a catalyst for all that. So we are seeing a lot of issues in Indonesia, especially for the production of Arabica coffee. Uh, we see a soil erosion, uh, fertility issues, um, lack of tree shades, um, uh, deforestation, uh, and, and that's all being kind of accelerated by climate change. So if we do not address um, you know, the social and economical aspect um, it's going to be very difficult for the farmers to get ready for the challenges that are yet to come um, with, with the climate changes that we are facing. Um, and then, obviously, what we see as, a, as, a, as the biggest threat is a potential decrease in uh, the production of coffee in Indonesia in the, in the long run and, and or a shortage of uh, workforce uh, dedicated to coffee farming. Um, so again, that's kind of the, the, the conundrum. And um, what we are trying to do is contribute to addressing the root cause, which is basically to prepare the existing generation of farmers uh, to become more um, economically sound and, and also to focus more on sustainable practices and, and not forgetting the next generation of farmers. Uh, next one, please. So um, what, we, what we are doing in terms of regeneration, um, we are basically working on capacity building for farmers. Uh, we do a lot of training um, in partnership with uh, uh, JDE um, and also the Louis Dreyfus Foundation and Pure Projet. So we focus a lot on um, you know, simple practices like uh, grafting, like uh, just uh, compost applications, um, you know, there's a lot of low hanging fruits, uh, no pun intended, obviously, when it comes to uh, the coffee sector in Indonesia. And so far, we've been very effective in increasing the productivity, increasing the in improving the quality of the of the coffee that is being produced. Um, and we will continue to, to use that as a tool uh, to improve, uh, uh, you know, as much as possible, the livelihood of the farmers within our supply chain. Obviously, also we look at the uh, ecosystem. So, just better soil and water conservation practices. Uh, we engage a lot in agroforestry, um, which, not to be confused with intercropping, in the sense that we are not displacing coffee production. If anything, we are just um, providing shade for the trees. Um, and uh, obviously, when the trees uh, start producing, it's a, an additional or an alternative income for the farmers. Um, so that's at least how, how we look at it. Um, I cannot stress uh, enough how important it is to engage in partnerships. Uh, we always look for um, stakeholders in the private sector, but always engaging with the public sector as well to have uh, an, an impactful project. Um, and as much as possible, we try to involve people across the supply chain, including both our suppliers and customers. Uh, next one, please. And I think I'm running a bit of time. So this is the last slide. Um, some of the some of the KPIs that uh, that we managed to achieve: uh, 450,000 trees planted, or over over 450,000 of uh, 15 different species. I've seen a lot of questions about the different species. We can talk a little bit more a little bit more about that. Those those trees are now. Um, coming to production. So we are still in the process of um, monitoring the, um, the results and, and the impact on, on the farmer's livelihood from the production uh, of those fruit trees. Um, in terms of the gap trainings, we, we've worked so far with over 10,000 farmers. 
um, and 700 hectares worth of land that, that was restored. And also we've helped to build uh, four Arabica coffee community uh, nurseries. Um, the, the, the main results have been, and for me, the most important, we can see a change of mindset. So a lot of the sustainability values um, are, are now getting more imprinted in, in this uh, current generation of farmers. And we are working to get those values imprinted in the next gen generation of farmers. So we can see that as, a, as a, probably the biggest uh, achievement. Um, obviously you have a lot of tangible, so adoption of better farming practices with, uh, for, for example, 10% reduction in the use of um, herbicides. Um, another positive impact is on yield improvement. I saw my colleague in Vietnam saying, um, you know, two to two and a half tons a hectare. In Indonesia, we are still running a little bit behind, uh, but we've seen quite quite a, a good result. I think um, in a recent survey, we are reporting about 22% yield improvement, but in some cases it can get up to 50% improvement. So obviously th this is a very important um, milestone as Indonesia needs to catch up on the productivity of coffee. Uh, and as I mentioned, the agroforestry results are coming out now. Uh, the, normally the trees take to five to seven years to, to start uh, producing, uh, but we're quite optimistic that we will see obviously a positive impact on um, revenue generation and diversification for the farmers that we are working with. Ken, I think I'm, I'm pretty much done with my seven to 10 minutes. So. With that, I would like to thank you again for um, having me and, and for sharing your experience. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes. Um, thank you, Rubens, for um, the, uh, the presentations and the insights uh, uh, from uh, LDC Indonesia on uh, your uh, activities, especially in the uh, vocational uh, activities, capacity building for um, the farmers, not only the existing farmers, but also the um, uh, you are also um, uh, having, uh, involving more um, younger farmers uh, in your uh, uh, projects. Um, and you also um, stressing on um, the importance of um, partnership. Um, not only uh, amongst the uh, companies and also uh, the, the uh, uh, private sectors related, but also partnership with public um, uh, actor uh, as in uh, governmental agencies, for instance, uh, uh, in, in, in the uh, activities that you have. Um, okay, I think we are going to talk more on that in the uh, Q&A sessions later. Uh, uh, if you can stay uh, for a while here. Um, uh, next, we have... Um, Mr. Fitrian uh, Adiansia, um, he is the chairperson of the Sustainable Trade Initiative, uh, IDH Indonesia. Hi, Pa Fitrian. Uh, I see you're already here joining us. Um, glad to see you today. Hope you are well. Thank you for joining us. Um, Mr. Fitrian is global envoy for uh, nature-based solutions at uh, IDH Sustainable Trade Initiative, uh, executive chairman and founder of the Sustainable Trade Initiative in Indonesia and country representative of IDH in Malaysia. Uh, he has more than 24 years working experience in the field of sustainability, environmental economics, natural resource management, commodities, climate change, uh, and energy in Indonesia, Australia, and Asia Pacific. And Pavitrian is also a board member of Pisagro and also board member of Indonesia Sustainable District Alliance and Sustainable Coffee Platform uh, of Indonesia. And today he is going to share on how to enhance uh, deforestation free commodity through very fast sourcing area or VSA for coffee sector in Indonesia. Uh, Pavitrian, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ken. Uh, hopefully you can hear me uh, quite clear. Um, yeah. Talking, yeah, in a, a very crowded uh, or noisy uh, coffee. Uh, well, we're talking about coffee, so it should be in coffee at the, uh, we start. Um, thank you so much for these invitations uh, to Croatia as well. I think uh, many of the panelists or speakers uh, before me have already mentioned quite well about the importance of uh, transforming and so supporting uh, the development of sustainability in the coffee sector. Uh, Ruben also has mentioned quite clearly. Uh, can you hear me? I... Yes, we can hear you uh, well, Pavitrian. 
Okay, so um, I would uh, like to say that um, the idea of the very fast sourcing areas, uh, if you can uh, share the uh, screen, uh, can, thank you so much, uh, is uh, or has come from the fact that uh, we've been developing uh, interventions in uh, different supply chains uh, in Indonesia and also every or other countries. Uh, trying to support uh, you know, farmers and also uh, companies uh, in the context of transforming uh, the practices. But uh, we also uh, did realize, and we still do realize, that uh, any support in the supply chains, uh, you know, supporting transformation and sustainability, would mostly only benefit those that are uh, considered as players or beneficiaries of the supply chains. And then uh, in 2015, if you remember, uh, we experienced uh, mass forests and land fires uh, in Indonesia, especially in uh, Sumatra. Uh, we then uh, tried to change uh, the approach. Um, I'm, I'm trying to use uh, the, can you hear me now? I hope uh, you can hear me now, um, much better. So. Yeah, in, we can yes. we can hear you, but uh, there are still noises uh, at the background. Yeah. But we can hear clearly. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about this. Uh, hopefully, this is much better. Um, well, anyway, um, in, in 2015, um, uh, we realized that uh, even uh, the support that we do uh, or we did uh, for farmers and also concessions and companies uh, along particular supply chain would, would only benefit the, those uh, players in the supply chain. And then uh, the experience in 2015 um, uh, told us that, uh, for instance, uh, when it comes to fires, when it comes to deforestations, uh, even if you got certifications, you know, farmers got certification or companies got certifications, but the surrounding areas, uh, the players in the surrounding areas were still doing business as usual, uh, the impacts uh, are going to be felt by everyone. I mean, fires, for instance, uh, have told us that uh, you know, in jurisdictions or provinces in Sumatra or Kalimantan uh, impacted uh, by fires. Uh, so this is something that we then realized that uh, since we are, uh, you know, approaching and working together with the different private sectors uh, in different commodities, uh, we think that we should uh, come up with some sort of a concept in which we can aggregate uh, the challenges and also address those similar challenges given uh, these are faced by uh, different commodities in particular areas uh, in, a, in a common and, and, and in a you know, similar desktop of uh, activities and efforts. So this is something we, uh, we let's say, uh, we, we did uh, and based uh, on this kind of uh, uh, justification and also reasons, uh, come up with uh, the ideas of very fast sourcing area. Uh, next slide, please. So we... Can you change to the next slide, please? Okay, so we then see uh, the importance of not only working with the private sector um, when it comes to the uh, development of the sourcing area or very fast sourcing area, because whether you are cultivating uh, palm oil, rubber, coffee, cocoa, many different things are faced uh, when it comes to challenges uh, by farmers or by uh, different companies are quite similar and legality, strengthening farmers organizations, lack of input, uh, lack of uh, um, you know, access to uh, finance as well as uh, access to market. So then we group this type of similar uh, challenges uh, and then talk to uh, different players in similar jurisdictions and then ask also the government uh, to come in. And with government uh, playing a vital role uh, to work with the government to develop what we call green Bird plan. So this is uh, a kind of a, a starting point uh, to provide uh, a different umbrella framework showing uh, not only to the government, but also to the private sector and the farmers that government uh, at the subnational level now is quite uh, serious about pushing forward for sustainability. And of course, this shouldn't stop at this uh, level or at these directions. We want this to be then translated into the programs and new planning as well as budget. Without a certain a sufficient budget coming from the government, it will be much challenging for uh, them and also for the private sector partners uh, to push forward for transformation. So this is our something that uh, we uh, you know, have been undertaking uh, and also working in collaborations with uh, the government as well as the private sector in 
ensuring that the, the policy framework, uh, the programmatic framework, as well as, well as the budget uh, uh, development, uh, you know, in a way synergize uh, to support the transformations in a particular uh, jurisdiction or sourcing areas. But this is not also uh, sufficient. And so we need to connect not only the government proper sector, but also the eventual buyers. The eventual buyers that would like to have uh, sustainable products or value-by products, uh, they need also to, uh, you know, start from the beginning working together with the farmers as well as with uh, local organization and local government to ensure that the development will then lead to uh, matching uh, the requirement of the market. And we also then um, uh, work together from the get-go with the financiers because to have transformation, especially in this kind of scale, would require tremendous amount of costs tremendous amount of investment and we, we, we want and we have to uh, engage and also uh, bring uh, from uh, the beginning uh, the financiers uh, to see also what sort of gaps uh, that we can address and what sort of investment uh, in, you know that can include uh, capex and also opex uh, to have this kind of transformations uh, next slide please so this is just an uh, an example uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, of uh, one particular very sourcing areas uh, that we have developed. Uh, this is in Aceh. Uh, just a disclaimer: um, the beginning or the prototyping of this uh, very sourcing area in Aceh Tamiang and Aceh Timur started with two commodities: palm oil and rubber. But now, uh, with other districts in Aceh, we are also trying to incorporate uh, coffee, cocoa, and spices, and I think eventually also aquaculture. Uh, basically, uh, after the regulatory framework uh, that we got uh, with the, the local government, uh, we then created and facilitated uh, and supported uh, the uh, compact or the agreement among different stakeholders. And of course, uh, with the leadership of local government, uh, the agreement uh, consisted of, uh, let's say, the targets of uh, how much productivity that we want to uh, achieve. Uh, and because of that, we know the baseline and uh, we understand what sort of gaps uh, uh, that we need also to address. Uh, of course, quality uh, of the, the products, strengthening farmers, and, and so on and so forth. The second element would be what sort of element of what sort of component of uh, protections ecosystem that we want also to contribute. Uh, because many uh, companies and many buyers have asked that they want to uh, particularly source uh, commodities, be it coffee, palm oil, and others. Uh, coming from the areas that are not linked to deforestation or not linked to fire or not linked to uh, ecosystem degradation or biodiversity degradation. So we want also to see whether there are commitments uh, coming from different stakeholders uh, to achieve this and also to contribute to the protection, restoration and conservation of ecosystem. As you can see in, in this area, for instance, there are concessions as well as farmers' uh, land or farm lands that are located in the buffer zone of the soil ecosystem. So we then would like to improve their own uh, productivity in their own land. Uh, with that, uh, we also want them to contribute back to the restoration and uh, of the uh, Louis Circle system. Uh, last but not least, of course, we want uh, to have an objective in which uh, any intervention in these areas would then contribute to uh, the improvement of welfare of smallholders. So these are the things that uh, I think uh, can uh, be used as the foundations of not only the agreement but also the milestone and program uh, to achieve very fast sourcing area. But to have very fast sourcing area, of course, you have to develop the system, a transparent system in which buyers, growers, local government, and farmers need to agree upon with certain KPIs uh, that are also agreed. So, this kind of the connections uh, that we have developed, uh, starting with farm. Uh, gradually now uh, with rubber and also different commodities, including coffee uh, and cocoa. Next slide, please. So, just to give you uh, examples, uh, with uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't call this success, but with the progress made in Aceh Tamiang and Aceh Timur, now certain districts are also willing uh, to uh, be exploring or to explore uh, options to develop their own sourcing areas in Aceh and also Sumatra in which coffee and different commodities are also part of uh, the uh, components or commodities that uh, would like uh, that, that would be uh, developed uh, in this kind of a uh, you know system i think the idea is uh, relatively interesting and also exciting uh, because uh, any farmers 
in this area mostly uh, or many farmers in this area mostly they are not only cultivating one particular commodity in many areas they cultivate also, also uh, like two or three different commodities so we can tackle uh, this uh, or their uh, challenges in, in one go i think the support will be uh, quite excellent and the contributions to the development of the sourcing areas uh, would be also uh, much better uh, at the end of the day i think uh, the public goods uh, in uh, the sourcing area or the landscape or the jurisdictions would be felt or would be uh, part of uh, you know common objectives uh, of different uh, companies or communities or of course uh, local stakeholders in, in this context. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the key uh, clear uh, elements as well that uh, to some extent uh, interesting for different companies that the way that we develop uh, sourcing areas so in uh, you know in different jurisdictions in indonesia and also i think in vietnam uh, we also have been developing in central highlands uh, linking to different companies for coffee uh, is that this system then uh, eventually and uh, gradually would be linked to the source up system at the global level so the source up system at the global level uh, now currently uh, has been developed and is uh, still uh, continually uh, being developed uh, with the help of uh, different companies as well, you know, the, the, the global consumer good forum companies and different types of stakeholders as well to ensure that any development, any progress uh, achieved by certain jurisdiction would be then recognized uh, by buyers or uh, private sector companies uh, at the global level. So the connections of sourcing can then be attached uh, to, let's say, uh, the progress made by certain commodities or cultivation of certain commodities from the sourcing areas. And I think it's not only about products uh, and volumes uh, being developed, but also the attributions when it comes to impacts, when it comes to outcomes uh, related to protection, restorations, and inclusions. If you look at only particular projects, I think the uh, scalable impacts are quite limited. Let's say we work together only with 500 farmers, uh, maybe protection of forest or the protection of peatland would only cover like, let's say 1000 hectares. But with this kind of uh, jurisdiction or sourcing area and source of connections, the protection of forest can be uh, reaching up to, uh, let's say even, you know, 100,000 or even half a million hectares. Of course, then we have to decide and we have to leave what sort of contribution that should come from different uh, entities and different parties at the local level and also uh, from uh, the big buyers. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, maybe this is my um, uh, last uh, components to share. As I mentioned earlier, to have scalable impacts or outcomes uh, coming from certain jurisdiction or certain sourcing areas would require a huge amount of investment and capital and costs associated with this. I mean, protection, restorations, uh, in addition to of course, sustainable commodities improvement, it's not cheap. Uh, these are not cheap uh, endeavors. So uh, we uh, are currently working together with uh, certain financial institutions as our partners that would provide blended finance, first loss guarantee, equity, mezzanine, uh, and different type of uh, uh, financial structure in which we hope that uh, this would then uh, be viewed as uh, an attempt to uh, reduce the risk associated with investment in jurisdiction, in sourcing area, and also in supply chains. Let's say if farmers, uh, we can cluster it into 5,000 uh, farmers or even like 1,000 farmers, if they have the uh, areas in the surrounding areas as forest or pitland, uh, sort of risks associated with this, of course, fires, of course, the encroachment, and then, of course, you know, uh, within uh, the uh, smallholders uh, themselves, they have still the risk of uh, not being able to pr produce uh, productively and with uh, higher quality. So with this kind of blended finance, uh, this associated with protection and, and, and conservation can be then supported uh, from the investment, like for instance, ecosystem services type of investment, whether this is biodiversity, carbon, or what have you. Uh, the like uh, of uh, uh, productivity and improvement, this can be blended with uh, certain investment coming from different impact investment. It can provide for uh, first loss guarantee. It can also secure, for instance, um, uh, the uh, period in which uh, farmers may not necessarily be uh, having uh, a productive uh, harvest 
So uh, our uh, investment fund uh, partners, for instance, they can provide for plus guarantee in year one to year three. Uh, and then the commercial banks can uh, jump in or come in uh, in year, uh, let's say, uh, four uh, and, and, and beyond. So this is something that uh, we, uh, we've been uh, in experimenting and pushing forward, this kind of blended finance. Uh, we got already th three deals. Um, that have already been concluded in the pipeline. We got now five or something different deals. Uh, we are, of course, looking forward uh, for options and explorations with different partners. Hopefully, with this kind of discussion, we can also have uh, new uh, ideas and new concepts uh, to be then uh, discussed and explored further. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so this is just an example in which um, Finance can help a lot uh, to uh, transform uh, smallholders type of activities. Uh, this is a particular, uh, not necessarily only coffee, but different type of commodities, of course, in which uh, farmers in the context of Indonesia now, they have already uh, been allowed to manage uh, certain forests. It is 76,000 hectare forest this is from West Kalimantan. They have different commodities, including coffee. But of course, the license is given to them uh, by the government is not about improving commodity. It's about showing that uh, farms can also protect and manage forests uh, sustainably. But of course, they cannot do them, uh, uh, you know, right away, and they cannot uh, do it by themselves. So we have to then figure out what sort of uh, good options uh, in terms of developing uh, their business model so that they can support the uh, their operation as well as then. Supporting uh, the protection and conservation of uh, the surrounding areas or the core zone of the uh, forest. So we manage uh, with them, with our private sector par partners, uh, to co-invest in developing uh, a certain uh, companies that have shares uh, from uh, smallholders or small farmers. And then this uh, have uh, uh, this company has been then acting as the aggregator for different commodities, uh, getting access to market. And then since two or three years ago, uh, they get also with a good, you know, uh, return and revenue coming from different commodities, including uh, coffee. Uh, they, they have already been able to get a soft loan coming from different entities, including a government owned uh, agency, as well as now FinTech uh, in, in Indonesia. So with that, uh, I would like to say, uh, next slide, please, uh, that I think it, it is quite uh, timely now to not only experiment and also exercise sourcing area, jurisdiction, landscape, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's not only about, you know, uh, ensuring that the productivity can be improved, but sometimes uh, we have the, the saying in Indonesia, if you can address common issues together, uh, I think the impacts would be much more uh, scalable. Uh, I mean, land legality, for instance, not only uh, faced by uh, coffee farm, it, it is also uh, faced by uh, farm with farmers, rubber farmers, and what have you. If, Local government then address land legality in, in one go. So different type of farmers will be then supported. Uh, farmers organization is quite similar. Uh, uh, improvement of productivity is quite similar. Access to market and also access to finance, uh, they are quite similar in terms of uh, key challenges and also key uh, issues that the farmers uh, ever face. So with that, thank you so much. Um, sorry with the uh, with regard to the noise. Uh, hopefully you can hear me uh, quite well. Um, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pafitrian, uh, for your um, um, presentation and for sharing uh, your experience, uh, particularly in the um, verified sourcing area uh, approach that you have um, in uh, IDH. Um, if I may take some notes here, uh, we just learned that uh, the verified sourcing area or PSAs, we can consider it as one of the solutions to produce sustainable uh, products in this occasion is for uh, coffee products, and and it's uh, in Indonesia. It has been implemented in some areas that you already mentioned, and um, this uh, approach uh, provides a direct link uh, between the uh, producing regions and also to the end buyers. And this is um, in such an inclusive an um, approach uh, uh, whereby you um, involve. Uh, all stakeholders, not only from uh, farmers, but also the companies and also um, governmental agencies to, like you said, to have um, a, a common understanding on how to um, take action on sustainability practice uh, within the area. And um, also um, this uh, approach is um, 
this works towards a situation where uh, those uh, stakeholders are um, recognized for um, their sustainability practice um, beyond only uh, individual farmers or um, certain com uh, communities, uh, but uh, the whole holistic um, uh, um, stakeholders. Um, well, thank you again, Pavitrian, uh, for your presentation. Um, I believe there are some uh, questions uh, here in the chat box, but first, um, if there's uh, any of the participants would like to um, raise some questions directly to the speakers, um, please do um, raise your hands um, in uh, through the button uh, below in your Zoom. Um, if, uh, if there is no one who would uh, raise their hands, uh, let me check uh, on the um, chat box for the question uh, for the global speaker. I think, um, okay, um, I think there, there, there's a questions on um, the role of government institution. And um, I think this question is actually directed to Pavitrian, but I, I also want to direct this question to Rubens, if I may. So um, the um, uh, role of uh, government um, agencies, maybe from Pavitrian, you can share uh, what, uh, how, how committed or how willing uh, are, uh, is the government um, to be involved in uh, this uh, very fast sourcing area approach. And then uh, for Rubens, perhaps uh, you have this um, uh, capacity building activities, vocational training with all the young farmers and also the existing farmers. Um, are, are you also engaging with um, uh, gov uh, government agencies in uh, your um, working uh, project area? Um, please, may, uh, maybe uh, Fitrian, you can uh, go first. You're still on mute. There are a number of roles that the government uh, can do, and they have to do it anyway. Uh, but in the context of uh, deforestation free commodities or sourcing areas, what we have seen so far and what we experience with, uh, with them is first and foremost uh, the regulatory framework uh, that uh, needs to be developed uh, coming from them. Uh, because without the uh, clear and appropriate regulatory framework, uh, there's a, a bit of confusion of what is, uh, you know, the right things to do uh, or things that can be done or cannot be done in certain jurisdictions. Uh, this is, that is why uh, we, uh, you know, work together with them and encourage them to uh, issue and develop this uh, green board plan and then translate it into their midterm development planning and program and budgeting. So as clear as possible in which then the private sector knows that, okay, uh, there are some priority areas that the government uh, would like to you know, put forward or to, uh, to support uh, and then cluster of smallholders are recognized and maybe then supported, uh, uh, complemented by the private sector and donors and organizations like us. So that's the first one. The second one, I think, um, usually in this uh, very fast housing area of deforestation free commodity jurisdictions, can we, uh, with the government, of course, we tend to uh, develop a kind of a, a governance structure or platform called uh, Center of Excellence in which they will then manage uh, the different ideas, uh, different objectives, and then try to align and synergize those things. And then uh, the stakeholders or different parties would then commit as well as uh, support uh, such objectives or KPIs with uh, different contributions. And then government usually, like party or provincial governor, would sit as uh, the leader of the steering committee because they uh, supposedly uh, would act as like uh, uh, neutral uh, referee and also they can facilitate that if there's a, there are differences uh, coming from different symptoms of pushing uh, for different priorities for instance uh, okay. thank you okay thank you uh, Fitrian. um Rubens uh, if you have some comments well I think Along the same lines, I mean, obviously, it's um, it's a lot easier said than done, right? Um, it's um, obviously changing the regulation would um, help a lot in, in terms of preventing new um, uh, areas of primary forest being cleared. But 
you're talking about smallholder farmers, you're talking about uh, subsistence agriculture, and it's a, you know, it, like I said, it's it's easier said than done. So I think this the experience that we've had so far is quite positive in Indonesia. Every time you sit down with the provincial governments, um, you, you know, and you and you have this um, uh, sort of public-private partnership proposals, they they are always very receptive. Um, and uh, it, it has to be a collaboration between the private sector and um, and the government. Because if you go and say that certain areas cannot be used for coffee production, then you know you're still talking about uh, smallholder, small-scale farmers that still need to 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 grow coffee for their livelihood. So there needs to be uh, um, a solution that you know, and and it can only be achieved if you engage both the private and the public sector. I mean, we have. Um, a good example in Indonesia uh, with the Bukit Barisan National Park in Lampung. Uh, it's an ongoing initiative um, with the with the basically the goal to relocate uh, some of the farming areas um, out of out of um, the national park. And, and again, it, it's a you know complicated and sensitive topic, but in, in the government can play a role and, and should play a role. And um, and um, but uh, yeah, obviously. At a, at a national level and using a little bit the experience that I have um, in, in palm oil, for instance, you know, the certification also can be quite important, right? Um, and um, in palm, the Indonesian government has already come up with um, uh, an Indonesian certification, sustainability certification with covenants and KPIs. So that, that could be something also to, to be studied in the future. It's important that if we do that, it should be aligned with international standards. Uh, um, but I think that would be a step in the right in the right direction. Uh, but then I, I again I I keep bringing that up. But you know, in, in coffee is a little bit different. We are not talking about big groups and conglomerates um, planting coffee and growing coffee in areas that are not supposed to be used for coffee. We're talking about families and and and, and small scale farmers. So there needs to be a, a, some sort of win win solution and. Like I said, the, the government in Indonesia, I think, is is willing to uh, to look into that. Hey, we, we can debate for a long time here. Replanting is an important topic as well. You know, uh, coffee trees are obviously aging um, and, and productivity is going even lower. So I believe if um, if the government uh, invests further in, in replanting, then you could prevent a lot of new areas being, being open, right? Uh, and that's also an ongoing um, topic uh, here in Indonesia. I'm not sure how it's done in Vietnam in terms of replanting, if it's a private sector initiative or if government gets involved, but I think that would help a lot in preventing uh, further deforestation. Okay, great, uh, Rubens, thank you. Um, I see someone's raising hands um, in the participant list. Um, if I may, uh, Mr. Carlos Triano. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Hi, this is, uh, this is Carlos Triano. I am from the European Forest Institute. I'm, I'm, right now I'm based in Malaysia, but we have some projects in, in Indonesia and uh, Vietnam. Uh, this is a general question for both of you is that, so talking about sustainability that's involved uh, to have different um, monitoring systems. Uh, it, it will be good if you can explain both uh, from ADH and, and LDC the approach to to monitoring those activities, right? To to be sure that the communities, the private sector, the government, the government, they are all in the same line. So maybe a couple of examples from you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for the question. Um, I think, um, Rubens, would you mind going uh, first to answer? No, that's a good question. I mean, um, I think uh, first things first, we need to be able to achieve um, a, a good level of traceability of our supply chains, right? And I think the, the, the coffee industry is now taking that more seriously. You need to understand you know, where the coffee is coming from. Uh, and then based on that, we can engage in, um, in satellite monitoring, we can engage in, uh, you know, field visits. Um, you know, we have a lot of people on the ground, um, not only um, monitoring 
um, developments in, in coffee, but also in, in, in palm oil and, and other commodities that we are uh, dealing with. So, but again, traceability is an important, um, is an important tool. So uh, that's something that we are really focused now um, to improve the level of traceability that we, that we have in our coffee supply chain. Um, and then after that, we can, um, again, I think satellite monitoring can be quite powerful. Um, but we also rely a lot on, on field visits, um, you know, to know exactly what's going on on the ground. Um, and, and through our projects also, the ones that I just presented, we also have a, a now a, a survey system. So we, we do monitor the, the development and the evolution of uh, the main KPIs that we have in that project. And that should also help us to understand, you know, what's happening in, in, you know, across our supply chain, right? In, 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 a, in a country like Indonesia. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, um, but that, that's, that's pretty much what I had to, to comment. Yeah, that's, that's good. And maybe if you can complement with the uh, so monitoring the, the social activities, not only the ones that we can see from, from satellites, or, but uh, on the social part, how do you do the monitoring? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that has to be, like I said, we, we use um, uh, our own resources on the ground. So we have um, our own uh, team of agronomists that uh, spend most of their time up country. There's a lot of telephone interviews, but there's a lot of physical um, surveys as well. Um, there's only so much you can rely on, on official data. So uh, we really take uh, matter into our own hands and, um, and we just send, send our people out and and that's pretty much how, how, how we do it. Um, we do that in conjunction with our crop surveys as well. So uh, several times a year, this team of agronomists have to go anyway up country to, to check on, on production. Um, and we try as much as possible to um, synergize between our research and our sustainability efforts. Um, I don't know, I mean, uh, Charlotte is here, my colleague. Uh, from the LDC sustainability team. I don't know if you want to add anything, Charlotte. Thanks, thanks Rubens. Um, so on our side, I think uh, over the years, we have been improving a lot this monitoring system, but you just described it uh, well. Uh, it's a partnership between our research and sustainability team. And today for the sustainability uh, activities we are conducting, um, basically we, we have before, uh, before intervening with the farmers, we are conducting what we call a baseline survey. So taking the main KPIs, we need to understand what is the current situation of the farmers. We will help uh, with our intervention. And uh, year after year, we are uh, going back to the same farmers and uh, collect uh, data about the same uh, KPIs to, to track the evolution. I think uh, there are still improvements to, to be made here. Uh, that's why we are also uh, collaborating a lot with uh, external partners. Last year, it was part of the slide uh, Rubens uh, presented earlier. Uh, we have been, for example, in, Lambu, in Lampung, uh, in the Lampung province, uh, conducted a survey uh, with the support also of the University of Lampung. So uh, in order to come, to come back to the beneficiaries, we have been uh, supported since 2015 in this province and uh, collect uh, data about uh, now their, their current practices to, to, to put in evidence uh, the evolution and the progress we, we, have, uh, we have made uh, thanks to intervention. So it's, a, it's actually a long way. Um, it's a journey uh, monitoring data, but uh, we, we are, I think, and it's not only about us, but uh, the sector in itself improving year on year and uh, sharing also, uh, more data to, to put on evidence these uh, uh, interventions we are making in collaboration. Thank you, Charlotte, for um, your information. That's uh, pretty much, um, I think uh, it answers the question of monitoring and traceability. And perhaps, um, um, Pafitian, are you still there? Uh, maybe perhaps you have some comments on um, the, the issue of uh, monitoring or traceability, perhaps from your experience in IDH uh, in okay. this uh, PSA approach. I, I don't think uh, Pafitian is still here. 
Okay, I think I think I think he's not here anymore. Okay, then um, I think we're running out of time. So um, a great session. Thank you, Rubens, uh, for your time. Um, and also great insights from your side on your uh, project from in LDC and coffee sector in Indonesia. Um, perhaps the, the, if any the, of you would like to oh. Yes, Sorry, Ken. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, my pleasure again. Uh -huh. uh, I see a lot of questions about um, uh, still about the species of trees. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to me and Charlotte. Uh, we can share our experience. Obviously, you have to be very careful how you select the, the trees. Um, but yeah, I, th I think a lot of the questions I see on the chat are related to the intercropping and the agroforestry. So yeah. we are more than happy to share a little bit further on our experience. Oh, we, at least we know it's coming from a Spanish speaking country. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, well, yeah, thank you, Rubens. Perhaps for those. Yeah, who sorry, 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 I'm here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, um, uh, if, if any of you still have questions, you can just put it in the chat box. Perhaps uh, Rubens and Charlotte will be happy to answer those questions if you uh, still have time to um, stay here until the end of this uh, this webinar. Um, again, thank you, Rubens, for uh, the, uh, the presentation, your insights, a great session. Um, I believe now we have um, our friend from uh, PTSA, uh, Sherry. Um, who will be uh, facilitating, facilitating the next session um, on the uh, coffee sector in the Philippines. Over to you, Sherry. Thank you, Ken. Thank you to the speakers for enabling us to see the situation, challenges, and insights to better the coffee sectors in your countries. So I think um, uh, let me uh, say an advance apolo apologies for everyone because we might need to extend a little bit. But we will try out our best with the indulgence of our next two speakers. We will try our best to wrap up at, at about 4.40 or 4.50 um, in the afternoon. Um, let me uh, just uh, give a short introduction about the Philippines um, coffee industry. So in the Philippines, uh, small farmers are country's main producers of coffee, basically from the Mindanao Island. The four varieties grown are Robusta. Um, Arabica, Excelsa, and Liberica coffee. With an ever-growing population and boost in SME development, the demand for co coffee product production rises at a level that is far from commensurate to the current trend of production. So some challenges being addressed by the current initiatives are farmers shifting to other crops, less productive farm practices, limited knowledge and appropriate technologies, aging farmers, and limited access to credit and fair market and certification. So while the speakers in the previous uh, segments from Indonesia and, and uh, Vietnam focus on the challenges in the domain of coffee production, the next presentations will focus more about partnership examples to create strategic solutions and impact at scale. Without further ado, let me go straight to the introduction of our first speaker. Our first speaker is the Chief Executive Officer of Coffee for Peace, Coffee for Peace. For Peace is a multi-awarded social enterprise and inclusive business based in um, Mindanao. Among its many um, accolades, Coffee for Peace received the 2019 Sustainable Business Awards as the best flagship initiative and the best social enterprise. Ms. Georgie Pantoja, our, our next speaker, is the president and co-founder of CFP and was recently awarded as one of the only three awardees of the prestigious Oslo Business for Peace Award for her role in building peace in conflict-stricken areas. Ms. Georgie is a food service administration graduate from the University of Santo Tomas and a social enterprise development from the Atene University Graduate School of Business. Her presentation will showcase their unique approach and experience in their coffee business and advocacy in the Philippines. So let us acknowledge Ms. Georgie Pantoja, the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of, of Copy for Peace Philippines. Ms. Georgie, you have a maximum of 10 minutes for this presentation. The screen is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am humbled to join this story sharing on coffee represented by different um, groups, big and small corporation. And I bring with me stories of indigenous people and smallholder farmers. So I will be talking about our partnership models towards growth 
of coffee farmers. And the model that we use are anchored in the peace uh, concept. So um, I think our stories can be best told through this video. Can you show the video, please? lupa ng mga bagubo tagabawa. So, from the municipality of Santa Cruz and a portion of Davao City, Bigos, Bansalan, and Makilala is part of the bagubo tagabawa tribe. Ang buhay po namin sa barangay Managa, yung pumasok na yung mga settlers, hindi naman maiwasan na pumapasok sila. Kasi yung mga uh, bagubo, wala namang kasing alam noong una. So, relational harmony with others. Anong ibig sabihin nun? We are peace uh, missionary and we work in conflicted areas and we go to the Muslim areas and we listen to their stories. As we do that, I cannot understand talking about peace without addressing the economic issues. My lens was looking for something that would address the immediate needs of those people and I saw that coffee was being served to us and I said, wow, coffee is a common drink for the Muslims for the Lumads or the indigenous people, and for the Christians. So probably I could use coffee as an iconic product for peace, a vehicle for peace. And that's how it started. Yung Kupi for Peace, silang Ma'am Juji, sila po yung nagatudlo sa amin doon sa Dabao. Bumibili sila ng chiri sa amin, dalalin namin sa Dabao. Doon namin i-ginaprasis. Sabay kami lahat yung may-ari ng kape, siya po yung mag-prasis doon sa kanilang processing area sa Dabao. Doon kami naka, ano, naka sinati ng yun pala ang kape para mayroong potensyal na tumataas yung presyo sa aming kape. Ngayon, salamat sa ginoong ni Saka Gidamong Kape, ni Tasang Presyo. I told the coffee farmers that it's time to give back to the real owner of the land to have that participation in the income so that the Bagobo tribe could really be participants in the increased income for their community. Sa ngayon, okay naman yung mga Christians kasi nalaman naman nila na Yan talaga ang rights ng mga tribo. Alam nila na uh, itong lupa na ito uh, talagang sa tribo, sa bagubo. Kung magplanting mo o kape, kinahanglan ang ispis niya 2 by 3. So now Ariel, having uh, acquired all those skills in processing coffee, is now ready to give back. So what we did was put the processing area intentionally at their place so that they could learn and be blessed also 
So at least there would be continuous blessing from top to down. Coffee for peace is not just for peace because the meaning of peace in our peace is also harmony with your environment. So we support in protecting our environment because of the recent phenomenon of climate change. We need to be conscious in protecting our environment. And coffee is one good tree that could hold the soil and can be planted up in the mountain that could make our forest sustainable. So that's how we see it. So we really encourage businesses to be conscious while doing business, do good also. Because when you do good, you do well. So as you could see, our model is centered on peace. And you would see that in our next slide. Coffee for peace is not just coffee. It's just coffee. So let's drink. The third slide, please. So it's centered on peace, wherein you work with people, you work with the planet, you have your profit, and you have your partnership. So um, I would like to explain to you more about peace. What is peace? What is peace to us? Next slide, please. Peace is talking about our well-being. Peace is talking about our relationships. And peace is talking about our context. It is our being centered and produces what we do and produces what we have. So it's anchored on the relationship that we have on our creator, with ourself, with the creation and with others. And with that as a leader, we have to have the heart of a servant, a soul of a teacher, mind of a manager and strength of the leader. Now, when go to, going to the next slide, people. Why is people part of that? Because we deal with them. We deal with farmers. We deal with processors, traders, and distributors. We have our employees. We have our consumers. And of course, the most important are our investors or impact investors or lender. Now, planet is also important because when we used up too much of our soil or spoiled our planet, then it will give up on us. So as I have said in that video, coffee is one good tree that could hold the soil and also protect our water source. Next would be partnership. So partnership involves people too, because you have to be partnering with your farmers as a, as a business, partnering with other processors, traders, and competitors, partnering with your employees, with the consumers, and with your impact investors. Also partnering with the government and um, universities for research. So it involves partnership. And as we go through, the most important also is profit. So profit, if you deliver your goods with quality, safe, and clean, delivered at the right time, and price right, which is affordable to the consumer. So those are the things that you needed to ask, anchored on peace, people, peace, profit, partnership, and our planet. Now, what does it bring to us? The next slide would show you that 
we work mostly uh, with indigenous people and it brings us joy to listen to their stories because coffee, people, culture, and nature are all related. They are all in one story. Now, what is your story? Now, the story of Coffee for Peace brought us, since we founded this in 2008, we have 13 years of experience, experiencing the whole value chain and working with a lot of people. And that brought us an Oslo Business for Peace Award telling us that we have contributed in the peace situation here in Mindanao. We have, we were given sustainable business award by the ASEAN Business Award in 2018 and in 2019 Sustainable Business Award because we does not only provide good income for the farmers, but also provide peace, the culture of peace, and provides the protection of our environment. Recently, we received this award from Department of Labor because they are affirming that we are treating our employees right by giving them the proper benefits and salaries. So in totality, Coffee for Peace is not just another coffee. It is just coffee and our model, which you would see on our last slide, are anchored in peace. But it is important for us to connect everything, people, planet, profit, and partnership. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Jaji. Yeah. Uh, so that's a very inspiring story. Truly what makes any initiative sustainable is really the people that make up the system. If we can still accommodate at least um, at max one question to each of our presenters uh, in the interest of time, yeah. Um, I think there was a question a while ago from Mr. Thomas Niem to address to uh, Ms. Joji. Uh, Mr. Sir, Mr. Thomas, would you like to, to ask your question um, in person to her? Okay, let me just read. Uh, he's asking about what are the species planted um, and are you intercropping with coffee uh, with regards to this experience of coffee for this month? Um, with the coffee farmers that we have, they have vegetables, different kinds of vegetables around their coffee farm. So they have also uh, coconut trees interplant with their coffee and some have uh, abaca. So those are the things that they have intercropped with coffee. Ms. Joji, I hope that answers the question, and unless there's a follow-up. But for now, let us um, go straight to the next question, which is addressed to both of you, Ma'am Ma Ruth and Ms. Ms. Joji. Um, this, is, this is from Ernelia, Ernelia Kau, um, asking about, are there examples of partnerships regarding R&D on coffee? Uh, Ms. Joji, would you like to answer first? <laughs> yes. We are brewing that right now. And um, actually they are so active right now because we wanted to experiment on other byproducts. Personally, I have experimented on the cascara, the pulp of the coffee, wherein we produce a tea. So, and also in the pipeline together with other uh, researchers would be the coffee leaf, which is already being marketed in Vancouver because I saw that and I said, wow, this would provide other income for the farmers. So yes, research and development are very much involved with our what, what, what we do. Yeah, uh, on our part, thank you, Ms. Joji. Uh, she's one of our friends. Uh, on our part, really research is very important right now with what we're to, uh, teaching the farmers. No? Um, we are teaching them the aspects of regenerative agriculture. 
which is composting, agroforestry, and intercropping. And I saw a lot of questions about will intercropping be bad uh, for the farm? Actually, it is really our dream if uh, the farmers in the Philippines can sustain themselves. But uh, sadly, we know that everybody is economically challenged, especially this pandemic. So the land of the farmer in the Philippines, the average size is only one to 1.5 hectares. Now, there is no rule to say that you cannot increase the, uh, the productivity and the profitability of your 1.5 hectares. Okay, the land is not growing, but the farmer can definitely grow his income. So that's why we are balancing as well, intercropping, composting, and agroforestry, which I saw also in the presentation of Ms. Joji. Thank you, Ma'am Ruth and Ms. Joji for sharing such insights and initiatives that are um, happening in the Philippines that might also invite um, um, more partnerships in the region. I think I was advised that we can still entertain one more last question uh, for both. This is from Nico Ralionza. Um, good afternoon, Ma'am Ruth. Uh, the Philippine government released the coffee roadmap a few years back. How has the pandemic affected the goals or targets of the roadmap? roadmap sorry. Oh. And will there be another roadmap in 2022 or is it dependent on the incoming administration? Thank you. I did not whisper to the gentleman about to ask that. Huh? Uh, I was a member of the team who developed the first Philippine uh, national roadmap. Now, the success of that is where we're able to do the good agricultural practices for coffee. As um, really well, Miss Joji here is part also of the technical working group for the roadmap in the good agricultural practices. Now, we are tasked by the Philippine government, and again, Joji and I are working on it, to revisit and revise the roadmap on three categories. The first category of the Philippine Coffee Roadmap is for short-term objectives, which is up to next year, mid-term, which is up to three years, and long-term, which is five to 10 years. So definitely, yes, we are working on the roadmap already to make the numbers more achievable. Because remember, as I said, there are 14 high-value crops in the Philippines uh, fighting for the targets and the funds and also, you do not also, um, I haven't even um, mentioned rice and corn, which are the most favorite uh, crops in the Philippines for obvious reasons, probably for Asia. So yes, we are working on it. And as soon as uh, this is approved, then we will be able to call uh, what we call a um, consultative meeting to be able to present to you the results of the roadmap, which myself, Georgie, and the rest of the uh, roadmap development team selected by Secretary Dar of the Department of Agricultural working on feverishly. Thank you, Ms. Georgie. Um, yeah, uh, we, let's hope that these initiatives and leadership, strong leadership of both of you in, in your own spheres will, will lead to, will attract more as government support to the farmers. Uh, to grow the coffee industry in the Philippines. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I, again, I invite everyone to, to use the chat box. Should you have further questions, just leave your contact information to the speakers and we will convey to them. Yeah, yeah. Jerry, excuse me, maybe what I can just say to the, the people here, like what Georgie and I have been doing, we've been working on coffee for the longest time. Um, you do not stop. You know, you, you help the farmer in a value chain approach. You don't always only hold his hand, but you hold his feet, his head and everything. Okay, so that I think is the new buzzword which we're working on value chain approach to coffee production, Joji, right? And mm -hmm. uh, best of all, I think um, any government, if you do not present a good business case, then it will be difficult for your government to help you. So that's what Joji and I are doing. We are presenting that coffee is a good business case, not only for the farmers in this country, but for the country as well. And as you could see, we have voices of the big multinational corporation and smallholder farmer contributing into this roadmap so that it's not only manufactured or created by big corporation, but also the voices of those, those small farmers are heard and they can contribute through us representing that. Yeah, indeed, that bottom-up approach uh, really reflects how you look at it at a sustainable um, manner. Uh, at this point, as we promised, we tried to our best to wrap up at this time. So let me um, uh, 
transfer the screen to Reggie, who I believe will um, uh, tell us some closing statement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Georgie. And thank you to everyone for being really active and engaged. I've learned so much and I'm optimistic that the connections made here today will, will spark collaborations in the future. Um, could we take a, a short feedback survey of how we did today, um, if someone can launch the poll? And meanwhile, uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to us. Uh, you have our email addresses, uh, contact details of our individual country partnerships for any follow-ups, or you can ask them for the contact details of some of the speakers. We will be sharing the recording and presentations where they have been approved for sharing by our speakers. So thank you again to all our distinguished uh, panelists and to all of you for attending this learning and sharing event. Um, I think we should end here. Stay safe and wishing all of you a good rest of the week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Ruth, and all the speakers. Thank you. Yeah, Long time picture taking, Reggie. Oh, we didn't. We didn't arrange. I think uh, next time. Thank you very much. Of course. Oh. I hope to see you all again. Thank you very much, uh, Reggie and the team. No? Thank you so much. We enjoyed Bye. it. Thank Bye. you, Mrs. Bye. Ruth and Mrs. Jo Joji. Thank you. Bye bye Emperor po. Yeah, thank you. Hi, hello po. Bye bye yes. po. Maraming salamat. Hi, ma'am. Hi. You. Nice to meet you in semi uh, seminar. Maybe next seminar I want to join with you. And next time I will visit you. Yes, yes, yes. Bye bye po. Bye bye.